now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. David Bryan, starring as Mr. District Attorney. This episode of the syndicated series, originally broadcast on March 15, 1953. This episode, The Case of the Lover's Lane Killing. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The district Attorney knows that crime is no respecter of social position. It can strike in the slums of the city, or it can strike, as this case did, in the vast and wealthy estates in the suburbs. The time is 1.37 a.m., and Howard Morton, a wealthy industrialist, is awakened from his sleep by the sound of his daughter screaming. Daddy! Daddy, help me! Help me! Well, what's the matter? Bob. He's dead, Daddy. He's dead. Ah, dead. What happened to him? <laughs> Connie, get hold of yourself. What happened? I'm frightened, Daddy. There, there was a man with a bandana over his face. Where, Connie? Where? At the old road near the lake. We were parked there listening to the music on the car radio. When all of a sudden... Oh, it was horrible. Oh, sit down. Sit down while I call the police. Then you've got to have a doctor. Get something for your nerves. He, he tried to hold us up. Bob had a gun in the car. They fought for it. Operator, get me the police. I, I want to report a murder. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Connie. Connie. Walters. Me. Wake up, somebody. Wake up. Wake up. The butler said we could wait here in the library, Chief. The doctor's still in with the girl. She had a mighty bad shock. She tell you where the killing took place, Harrington? Yeah, one of the old roads down by the lake, over in the state park. I've got uh, three squads beating around the lake roads now. They'll call us as soon as they find the body. Mm. Now, what time is it? Mm, almost 5 a.m. we get the light in half an hour. If the girl can't talk to us soon, we'd better get over to the lake with the men. Oh, here's the girl's father now. How are you, Mr. Garrett? I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I understand, Mr. Morton. May we see your daughter now? I'm afraid not. The doctor put her under sedation. She must have absolute rest for a few hours. Well, we'd better come back later then. Well, thank you. I think that would be best. I'll walk out with you. Is there any way we can get to the lake from here without driving back to the highway? Yes, there is. Go around to the rear of the house, past the guest house and the stables. You'll find a road there that intersects several of the neighboring estates. We use it more or less as a bridle path, but it's suitable for a car. Fine. That'll save us a few minutes. What time was it when your daughter got home, Mr. Morton? Just uh, a minute or two before I made my call to the police. A little past 1.30. I'd only been in bed about an hour. The servants locked up at about 12.30. Remember, behind the house and past the stable. We'll find it. See you later. Harrington, 
Mob Brady must have been standing right beside his car when he was killed. Our tracks are pretty heavy where the car was parked. Yeah. I, uh, I only saw the Morton girl for a minute before the doctor got to the house. Couldn't make much out of what she was saying, but I gather that Brady was killed with his own gun. How come? Well, one of the servants told me that Brady carried an automatic in the glove compartment of his car. I guess it was robbery, all right, though. Brady doesn't seem to have a scent on him. No wallet, no wristwatch, nothing. Yeah, no doubt about the motive. Well, I guess we can have the body moved into town. Somebody will have to notify his folks. Yeah, keep a squad of men out here, though. What do you want them to do? Beat the brush and look for Brady's gun. While they're looking, we can follow this extra set of footprints, see where they lead. Yeah. Hey, hey, you fellas, comb this area. Find that gun. Okay. Yeah. Tracks head this way. <sighs> well, whoever he is, Chief, he didn't make much of an attempt to cover up his tracks. No, unless he had a car parked along here someplace waiting for him. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. Footprints leave the road here. This may be where the trouble starts. No, no, they just turn off to this footpath. What's down the path? In that clump of trees. Huh? Oh. Yeah, it looks like a small cottage. Oh, this is State Park land, Chief. Can't be a private home. Oh, it must be a caretaker's cottage. State fire warden. You think he could be our man? Well, the best way to find out is to ask him. Keep your eyes open. Come into the cottage. It isn't even 7 a.m. yet. He was out late last night. Might still be asleep. Take a look through the windows. Yeah. Yeah, he's there all right, Chief. Yes. He may still have Brady's gun tucked under his pillow someplace. Let's see if we can take him before he wakes up. Easy. Door isn't locked. Good. Go in. Bedroom. There he is. Covered. Here are the boots. Right beside his bed. Look. Yeah, they made the marks. We've been following. All right. Wake him up. All right, you wake up. Wake up. What's the matter? Get up. Hey. What are you guys doing in here? Who are you? Well, my name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney. <laughs> what is this? One of Charlie's gags? You friends of Charlie's? I told you who I am, and it's no gag. What's your name? Brennan. Mike Brennan. What's the Let matter? Let us ask the questions, huh, mister? Where were you last night, Brennan? In town, to a movie. Why? Anybody see you in there? Friend named Charlie Ridgway. We ate together. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Clerk at Walton's Photo Supplies. I picked up a gallon of developing solution. I take a lot of pictures to my own developing. There's the solution on the table. You'll find the bill in that paper sack. What time did you start back from town, Brennan? Got the last bus out this way at midnight. Dropped me off out at the highway about 12.30. About a half hour walk from there to here. You see anybody after you left the bus at the highway? Why, yeah. Yeah, come to think of it, I did. I saw a fellow and a girl on the old road coming through the woods. I passed their car. Thought maybe somebody had had a breakdown. I looked inside, but there wasn't anybody in the car. Then I walked on a little further, and I met them, walking, too. I asked them if they were having any trouble, and... Go ahead. I said no, so I left. Better get dressed, Brennan. You're coming with us. But why? What have I done? If you don't know, you'll find out later. If you do know, we don't have to tell you. Watch him, Harrington. I'm going to look around for that gun. A gun? You heard him, mister. A gun. Just like the one I'm pointing at you. So get dressed and no tricks. I hope the Morton girl can give us some more information, Chief. We sure can't hold that Brennan for long unless we get more on him. No, he didn't have Brady's gun or anything else. There's Mr. Morton now, out front waiting for us. Yeah. Secretary told me you trusted somebody when I called to say Connie could see you now. 
I'm just a suspect, Mr. Morton. Nothing definite. May we go in? Oh, sure. She's upstairs in her room. She's still very nervous, though, gentlemen. Before you speak to her, I want you to know I'd consider it a personal favor if you try not to upset her any more than is necessary. We'll try not to, Mr. Morton, but a man has been murdered, and we must have all the information we can get. Of course. Mr. Garrett and his assistant have come back to talk to you, dear. Hello. Hello, Miss. Hello, Miss Morton. Miss Morton, would you mind telling us about last night? Well, there's... It's very little you don't already know. Bob and I hadn't dated for a long time. But last night he called, said he wanted to see me. We drove around, then parked down on that lake road. Mm -hmm. We talked for quite a while. You see, Bob was planning to get married next month to a girl named Mildred Peters. She's a, a school teacher, I think he said. Go ahead, Connie. Tell him everything. While we were talking, a, a man came up to the car. It was dark. He had a bandana over his face. You couldn't identify him by his features, then? No. He... He held us up. Made us get out of the car. Did he have a gun? I'm not sure. He had something in his hand. I don't know what. I was too frightened. He took Bob's wallet and his wristwatch. And then he told us to stay right where we were. And he didn't take anything from you? Oh, yes. Yes, he took my purse. And then what happened? Well, all of a sudden, Bob made a dash for the car. He got his gun from the glove compartment. But the man was right after him. They fought. The other man got the gun. And then he shot Bob and ran away. Gentlemen, if you don't mind, I think... Just a minute, please, sir. Uh, Miss Morton, what were you wearing last night? Just a plain blue taffeta dress. It's right there on the chair. No top coat? It was a warm night. You were in bed when your daughter drove home, Mr. Morton. Yes, I, I told you. I turned in about 12.30. Servants go to bed, too? Same time I did. I watched them locking up. All right, Harrington. We'd better run along. We can find our way out. Goodbye. That girl can make our case against Brennan when she comes down. I don't know, Harrington. Somebody's lying around here. Mr. Morton claims the house was locked up tight when he and the servants went to bed. But they both admit that his daughter came tearing into the house and up to his bedroom. Well, what's wrong with that? How did she get into the house if Brennan stole her purse? Her keys would be in the purse. Well, not necessarily, Chief. She might have had her house key in the pocket of her dress. That's why I took a look at that dress, Harrington. And that's why I know she's lying. That dress didn't have any pockets. March 15th, 1953, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan, from March 15th, 1953. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. 
A man had been murdered with his own gun in a lover's lane killing. Suspicion pointed strongly at a state park caretaker. I had the dead man's mother and his fiancée brought to my office for interrogation. I was with them when Harrington came back to the office with some vital evidence. Hello, Harrington. Hi, Miss Miller. Chief in his office? Yes, Brady's mother's with him and um, Miss Mildred Peters. Peters? Oh, that must be the school teacher Brady was going to marry. Probably. She looked like she'd been doing a lot of crying. What's that you've got? Well, fingerprints. Nice matching set. Lab crew lifted this set from the door of the death car. And we took this set on Brennan when we booked him. You're identical, all right. Yeah, Brennan's our boy. This ties it on him, but good. I wonder if the chief wants me in there. We don't want to see those. Go ahead. Yeah. The only boy I had left. Brother died six years ago. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Brady. Come in, Harrington. Sit down. Hey, uh, I thought you might want to see these right away, Chief. Please, Mother Brady, try to calm down. Mr. Garrett needs our help. I'm sorry. That's all right. This is Mr. Harrington, my assistant. Harrington, this is Mrs. Brady, and this is Miss Peters. How do you do? How do you do? do? Now, Miss Brady, how long did you say it had been since your son had been out with Connie Morton? Before last night, I mean. Six months. I thought it was all over between them. I thought she'd leave him alone when she knew that he and Mildred were going to be married. Didn't he brood about her much uh, during the time they stopped going out together? No. He knew it was for the best. She was spoiled. She never really wanted him. Until she found out he was planning to marry Mildred. Do either of you have any idea, then, as to why he called her and asked her to see him last night? He didn't call her. She called him. You're sure of that? I was there when he answered the phone. He didn't want to go. She must have been insisting, because after a while he said, all right, he'd meet her just once. For the last time. Yeah, it was the last time, all right. Well, thank you, ladies. That'll be all for now. You've helped a great deal. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Is it true what the newspaper reporters told us when we were coming in, that, that, that you've arrested the killer? Well, I wouldn't count on that just yet. You'll be informed. Thank you. I don't get you, Chief. Why did you say that? Those fingerprints on Brennan, you've got enough to get an indictment for a murder right now. I can get more than an indictment with him, Harrington. I can get a conviction. But I don't like convicting the wrong person. Now, let's get down to the lab. I want a set of the mug shots they made of Brennan when he was booked. Going to the lab, Miss Miller. Photo gallery. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you want Brennan's picture for, Chief? I want Connie Morton to look at them. See if she can make an identification. Yeah, she said the man who stuck him up had a bandana over his face. She said a lot of things. Basement, please, Marty. Was well, a bandana found in Brennan's clothing out at the cottage? Yeah. He says he wore it around his neck. Lots of guys who work outdoors do wear him, you know. I want to stop someplace and buy a different bandana. Different color and pattern. Oh? Huh? What for? You'll see tomorrow. I want to find out how many lies Connie Morton can tell. Because I won't be satisfied with the case against Brennan until we find Brady's gun and the things that were supposed to be stolen. Miss Morton must be feeling a lot better this morning if she's out at the stables. Yeah, a lot better. There she is now, over in the ring. Hey, what's she doing? Working out a jumper. Caesar. Now back again. Over. Walk at a jump, will you? I'll teach you. When I want you to jump, you'll jump. Take it easy with that horse. Oh. Mr. Garrett. Mr. Harrington. I didn't see you. Glad to see you recovered from your shock. I had to find something to occupy my mind. Jeffries, get Caesar out of the ring and unsaddle him. We can talk at the house. I thought working Caesar might relax me. I've got him entered in the garden show next Sunday. Be nice if the horse lives that long, the way you use a whip. It happens to be my horse and my business, Mr. Garrett. What do you want? 
A little help. We may have the man who killed Bob Brady. So the reporters told me. A park worker named Brennan. News gets around, doesn't it? Here's a photograph of him. Is he the man? He could be. He looks like the one. Well, what do you recognize? The scar on his chin? Yes. No, I, I mean, no. His face was covered. Uh-huh. With a bandana. We found one on Brennan. Well, is this the bandana you saw? Well, it was dark. But it was just like that one. I see. Well, thank you. Come on, Harrington. Is that all you wanted to know? Yes. That's all for now. Well, she took the bait on that bandana, all right, Chief. It's nothing like the one Brennan was wearing. I know. Hey, isn't that a Central Division car coming up the drive? Yes. Well, that's Miss Miller with the driver. Wonder what's up to bring her out here. Oh, Mr. Garrett. I'm glad I got here before you left. What is it? This letter. Came in the morning mail about five minutes after you left the office. I thought you'd want it right away. And we'll see what's in that letter following these important words from your favorite station. March 15, 1953, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Mr. District Attorney, March 15th, 1953. What's in the letter? Look at this, Harrington. Yeah, hand-printed on cheap stationery, addressed to you. Look in crevice of oak tree, 50 yards behind Brennan's cottage. That's it. Yeah, looks like Brennan trusted a friend who decided to double-cross him. What do you think it means? It means we're about to find a few stolen items, including Bob Brady's gun. You take a cab back, Miss Miller. Let the squad car follow us. Yep. Yep. Something else in here, if I can get my fingers on it. Uh, I got it. Ah, yeah. Hey, uh, Chief. Look, look at the inscription on the back. Bob from Mildred. Brady's wristwatch, all right. Yeah, nice haul. Gone, girl's purse, Brady's wallet and wristwatch. All practically on Brennan's doorstep. And here are Connie Morton's keys. The keys she let herself into the house with. They couldn't be in this tree and with her at the same time. Why would she kill Brady? Oldest motive in the world. Jealousy. Now we'll have to hold Brennan another 24 hours. And that'll be long enough to get what we need. Then Connie Morton can take his place. Well, we still can't prove anything. We'll have enough when I send that anonymous note through the lab for handwriting analysis. But the note isn't written. It's hand-printed. There'll still be similarity in letter formations. We can compare them against Connie's printing. Where are you going to get your sample to compare? The registration blank she sent to the horse show to enter her mount for the jumps. Ever see one of those applications? No. They say, please print. Well, 
Why do you have to see my daughter again, Mr. Garrett? You men have been seeing her every day. You've got to leave her alone. Well, don't worry, Mr. Morton. This is our last visit. Why can't I answer whatever it is you want to ask? Because you aren't there when Brady was killed. There she is, Chief. In by the stalls. Mind if we come in, Miss Morton? Or would you rather come out? What do you want this time? We thought you might like to know that we found Bob Brady's gun. An anonymous note told us where it was. A crevice in a tree right behind Brennan's place. Well, now you've got a good case. You can stop bothering me. Oh, we've got a good case, all right, but not against Brennan. Brennan didn't kill Bob Brady. Then... Then you still don't know who did it. Oh, yes, we know. You did it, Miss Morton. I oh, did it. dare you make such an accusation against my daughter. Get out of here. Get off my property. My attorneys will break you for this, Garrett. Get out! We'll go, but we'll take your daughter with us. What evidence do you have? A hand-printed anonymous letter that matches the printing on the registration blanks your daughter sent into the horse show. You better come along, Miss Morton. You're not going to be showing your horses this Sunday. You! Oh, give me that quid! That's something else you won't be using again, Miss. We'll get the best legal talent in the country. We'll beat you on this, Garrett. It's your privilege to try. But be true to yourself, Mr. Morton. You began to suspect she was lying the same time I did. She... She's not lying. She didn't know anything about it. I did it. I shot Brady. No, that won't work either, Mr. Morton. We've got our pinned down tight. Daddy, help me. Talk to them. Give them some money. What kind of a father are you if you can't help me? Shut up. You hit me. Yes. I should have started 20 years ago. Before I let you become what you are. Maybe I'm not legally guilty, Mr. Garrett. But I'm guilty of raising her the way I did. It's too bad you didn't think of that sooner. All right, Connie. Let's go into town. star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. When Connie Morton's attorneys saw that her protestations of innocence in the face of the evidence against her was not impressing the judge or jury, they persuaded her to enter a voluntary plea of guilty to murder in the second degree. She was sentenced to a prison term of 50 years. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. March 15, 1953, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain magic. Pain magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the fourth part of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Clinton Matter. This originally broadcast March 15th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Davis, Johnny. We're on our way. What? Yeah, we're in Grand Junction now. We ought to be in Clinton in three hours, running a couple of cars. I brought help. I can use it, Al. There's been a murder here. What? Last night, a building inspector named Richard Hobbs staggered into my room, tried to tell me something, but died before he could get it out. He'd been shot three times. Now, look, you be careful. Don't do anything until we get there. That's an order. Yes, sir. (laughs) 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Expense account item 13, 60 cents breakfast. I had it sent up to my room. Right behind the bellhop appeared the tall figure of Sheriff Doherty. How about inviting me for a cup of coffee? Sure. Sit down. Help yourself, Sheriff. Uh, thank you. You know, you're a mighty lucky man. In what way? I was almost holding you for murder, boy. That hob fella. Oh, that, yeah. You're looking into it, I suppose. Yep, yep, we're looking into it. I hesitate to ask, but are you getting anywhere? Uh, we figure he was shot sometime last night. Found his car downstairs all smeared up. Might have driven in from someplace. Where? We don't know. Well, do you know he blew town when the school fire broke out? We talked to Mrs. Hobb. I talked to her myself. Yeah. Naturally, we want to find out everything we can about this matter. Now, Hobb came up here last night and died in this room of gunshots. Why do you suppose he came here? I never knew the man, Sheriff. I talked to someone who did know him once. She said he'd been a pretty decent man at one time. If you and Chief Hanley and Vickery didn't tell him to leave town when that fire broke out, he might have told me himself. His conscience might have hurt him about passing a building that never could have stood an inspection. Go on. He might have heard that I was in town investigating it. He might have gotten sick and tired of the cheap, rotten little schemes here in Clinton and come back to help me straighten it out. You don't think much of our town, do you? Not the way it is, Sheriff. And I don't think much of you. In that case, I'll just try to keep out of your way. Do that. You do the same, Dollar. Here. Two hours later, Al Davies and a contingent of special operatives arrived in Clinton. Toby O'Brien from Continental States Insurance. Rob Schwartz and the Minx Twins from Columbia Adjustment, giving us a friendly hand. Todd Weaver, who just finished a case with the Canadian Adjusters Limited. Lou Doniger and Thad Thomas from Chicago. A pretty imposing group of expert investigators. Well, Johnny, you look okay. Yeah, still in one piece. Hi, Thad, Lou. See you. Fine. You want to get the door, Toby? Sure. Now, sit down there, sir. Now, this isn't any vacation trip, boys. We're all going to have to roll up our sleeves. All right, Johnny, you want to break it down? Yeah, all right. Well, this is a big one, fellas. If you'll all sit, I'll bring you up to date. Yeah, sure. No, sit right there. Three days ago, I came here on a tip that building irregularities were suspected in the new school building. The man who tipped the insurance company was the janitor, name of Julian Osborne. I never talked to Osborne because he died in the fire that destroyed that building. Oh, he called it off. I did talk to the man who designed the building. His name is David Baines. He claims none of his specifications were followed in the construction. So that's why it caught fire and went down so fast. His statement right here. Mm-hmm. Now, I talked to the school principal, Flory Hawkins. She supports Baines' statement. I wanted most of all to get a statement from the building inspector who passed the building, Richard Hobb. Hobb was murdered last night. Ah, No wonder you need help. All right, now, the sheriff, the fire chief, and the building contractor are all in on it. And there are too many leads for one man to follow, too many people for one man to talk to. The sheriff is making an investigation of Hobb's murder, but we'd better make our own. Now, you, Toby, and you, Thad, Hobb's your job. Find out everything about him, his bank account, his friends, his troubles, everything. Especially who killed him. His widow's Lucille Hobb. I met her last night. Leave it to him to find the woman. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, now. Rob? Yeah? Your man is the building contractor, Roy Vickery. He's big and tough and shrewd, and he talks softly. He owns and runs the whole show, if I'm guessing right. Now, take Toby and run Vickery down. Bank accounts, purchase orders, what kind of money he spends, and so on. Jim and Al Minx? Uh, All right, you two, find out everything you can about Julian Osborne, the janitor who was burned to death. Mm Mm-hmm. I want Lou Doniger to stick close to Fire Chief Hanley. Same thing. Everything and anything you can get on him. Al, you can handle Sheriff Doherty. The rest of you spread out. Start talking with anybody in town who might know anything. 
When you find one who's sick and tired of watching their town being run by a pack of hooligans, send them up here to the room. We'll try to get statements from them making specific charges, Al. Yeah. I want to guarantee every one of them security. So take them down to Denver, give them protection until it's safe to walk the streets here. If that's necessary, I'll arrange it. It's necessary. All right. All right, now report back to me anytime you want. Don't push anybody around. Don't let anybody push you around. Okay, let's get to work. Eight strange men moving through Clinton, Colorado, asking questions were as conspicuous as I wanted them to be. I knew everybody in the little town would be hearing about them and watching them. And sooner or later, I hoped that would pay off. An hour went by before I got any action. Johnny Dollar. You the fellow with the insurance company? Yeah, that's right. Who's this? Never mind. You're taking a lot of chances around here. We're going to take lots more. Do you have anything to say? Yeah. My name's Earl Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you. Name the place. You go down and stand in front of your hotel. I'll drive by and pick you up. I went down and stood in front of the Northern Hotel. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes. And then a car drove up. Two men in the front seat, three in the back. One of them leaned out. Dollar? Yeah. Come on, get in. Kennedy, construction foreman on the school. Hi. I thought you were going to be alone. Man next to you is Frank Ibsen. I'm the city editor of the Clinton Times. Those three boys in the back are Chuck Borden, Pete Geiger, and John Newton. They all worked for me on the construction. Hi. Hi. We seen the guys you brought into town. Really? Some pretty heavy boys. You know, the town's a little edgy with all that's happened. Fire, the janitor getting burned murder of Dick Hobb. None of which were caused by any of my investigators. How long are they going to be in town? As long as they have to be. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. How many did you bring in? Eight. I'll bring in 80 if I have to. Aren't you talking kind of big? This is a big job. Yeah. This far enough? Turn in here. Now what? Just want to talk to you. Well... Yeah. We're all willing to make statements, Dollar. I can charge Vickery with shortchanging the city on materials. These guys in the back seat will tell you the same thing. They came to me to ask my advice. I told them to talk to you, see what kind of man you are. I'll print anything that's the truth. Well, that'd help a lot, Mr. Ibsen. The paper's at your disposal, provided it's the truth. Fair enough. All of you be willing to testify? I mm-hmm. am. Okay. Now, a couple of other things. First... About Richard Hobb. You tell him, Frank. Hobb had big ideas, and he played ball with Vickery and the rest of them. It also looks like he was murdered because he was going to try to make it right. Now, about Roy Vickery. He was born here in Clinton, brought up here. He's built about one-third of the structures in this town, every one of them standing today, every one except the school. Any angle on that? Your insurance, $200,000. Okay. Where can I get a copy of the actual purchase orders used in the building? From Vickery. But I don't think he'd let you have them, if he still got them. Well, he gave me specifications that look like forgeries. I want the real thing. I'll have to have the real thing. Well, let me look around. Now, when and where do we make the statements? Let's go over to my hotel room and do it right now. Better use the newspaper office. You're probably being watched by now, Mr. Dollar. (laughs) Expense account item 14, $10, legal fees. Two hours later, I hired a notary to attest the sworn statements of Earl Kennedy, Frank Ibsen, Charles Borden, Peter Geiger, and John Newton. They were damaging statements that would bear considerable weight in a courtroom. But they were not enough to bring the matter before a court. Al Davies was waiting for me when I got back to my hotel room. Hi. Hi. Come here. Hmm, What is it? We've got friends. Yeah. One, two, three, seven. Mm Mm-hmm. They've been gathering around the hotel now for the last hour or two. Any of the boys run into trouble yet? No, none they couldn't handle. This could be ticklish, though, Johnny. Huh? Well, if Doe's down there uh, provoked a 
An open showdown. Yeah, that might be the idea. We aren't ready for anything like that yet. We're getting there. Come in. Well, hello, Sheriff. This is Mr. Davies, our chief inspector. Davies, are you the man who brought these troublemakers into town? I brought eight assistants with me, Sheriff. They're troublemakers. They've been going around asking questions, upsetting folks, getting in the way. I'd hate to see any of them get hurt. Like with those out there on the street? Those men out there are a group of indignant citizens who came to see me in a body and protested this investigation and the way it's being handled. They look more like hired bully boys, Sheriff. I'm asking you and Mr. Davies to withdraw these men you have working in Clinton. I'm asking you to do that by sundown. Suppose we don't, Sheriff. Then you'll take the consequences. Now, wait a minute. What? I don't want to keep you in a state of suspense, Sheriff. We're willing to take the consequences. What? If that crew out there shoot as well as they look, they're pretty rough people to go up against. Now, let me tell you, every man in this investigation is armed. We won't be intimidated, shoved around, or bullied by you, those bums out there, or anyone in this town. Now, you tell that to Mr. Vickery and Chief Hanley. And then you go home and stand in front of a mirror, Sheriff, and tell it to yourself. You gave us till sundown to get out. I'm giving you until sundown to resign as Sheriff. Now, if you don't do that, I'll see that you're forced out of office. Now, what do you think of that? You must feel mighty strong to talk like that. See this, and this, 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 and this. These are all sworn statements from people in this town who aren't afraid of you and Vickery and the others. You'd be surprised how many other people around here are on the verge of making statements, on the verge of not being scared of you anymore. So where are we, Sheriff? I'm going to kill you. Not now, you aren't. Go on, get out of here. I'll kill you, Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the end and the beginning of Clinton, Colorado. It all happens when the smoke clears. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. I think part five is going to be something special. March 15th, 1956, part four of the five-part Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar story, The Clinton Matter on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Please visit my webpage, classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about Classic Radio Collecting and contact me there, classicradio.stream. Also have links to all of our social media there as well. You can also hear our programs on demand. If you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. You can hear them at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Please take the time to thank this radio station and support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. We appreciate it, and we never forget it. And please tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on your radio dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.